Hi everyone, Young John here. Now I've just finished putting together this week's time travel to the year 1945 and as a special subject the VE Day celebrations. However, it's turned out to be rather special and a fairly uh, long programme, in fact well over an hour, and it may be too much for you to watch in one go. So I've decided to split it into two parts. Part one will be our normal time travel to the year 1945, and I'll talk about the events of the year, some of the uh, films that came out, and the music. Part two will be our topic of the week, which is the VE Day celebrations, and also, of course, the 75th anniversary uh, this week. The 8th of May 1945 was a very special day when the war-weary population celebrated victory in Europe. And this year is even more special as it's the 75th anniversary of VE Day itself. To mark this special day, our government even changed the date of the early May bank holiday from a Monday to Friday the 8th to ensure we could all take part in the celebrations. Sadly, COVID-19 has scuppered the best laid plans and most of the events have had to be cancelled. However, all is not lost as this week our time travel slideshow will focus on the end of the war in Europe and the celebrations during VE Day. First, we will look at the major events of 1945 that led to the German surrender. Oh, as this map shows, at the beginning of 1945, Germany was being invaded on both sides. Uh, from the east, the Russian Soviet forces were pushing in towards uh, Berlin, uh, and on the uh, west side, the British, the American and the French were pushing in from their side, slowly, uh, slowly coming towards each other. As an example, in January, the Allied forces had advanced from Paris to the Rhine, uh, and the United States Army crossed the Siegfried Line. On January the 30th, Adolf Hitler made his last public speech to be delivered, uh, expressing the belief that Germany will triumph. He still believed in this sort of illusion, which by now um, was obviously um, uh, unobtainable. On a sad note, in February, Anne Frank died of typhus in the Belsen concentration camp. Now, if you're interested to hear more about her story, of course, her diaries are available in book form. Between February the 4th and the 11th, uh, President Roosevelt, Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin held the Yalta uh, Conference. And this was to go into detail about how to deal with the Germans and uh, what to uh, accept as a surrender. You'll see in this that already Roosevelt doesn't look to, at all well. And of course, we'll hear more about that later in the slideshow. On February the 13th, the siege of B uh, Budapest ended with German forces surrendering to the Soviet Romanian forces. Further afield, February the 19th, um, the Battle of Iwo Jima, 30,000 United States Marines landed on Iwo Jima. Uh, and as we know now, it was a very bloody battle as the Japanese uh, would not surrender easily. This is an extract from a modern film showing you that sort of invasion uh, and the way the Japanese were waiting for them. Mike, take six men and bring that gun on the beach. Hold on, second for two, and move out! Stay down, come on, come on!
Let's move on. On March the 1st, President Franklin Roosevelt gave his last address to the United States Congress, where he reported on the Yalta Conference and what had been agreed by the Allies. On his return to America following the Big Three Conference at Yalta, President Roosevelt reports to the American people. There were two main purposes in this Crimea conference. The first was to bring defeat to Germany with the greatest possible speed, with the smallest possible loss of allied men. That purpose is now being carried out in great force. The second purpose was to continue to build the foundation for an international accord that would bring order and security after the chaos of the war, that would give some assurance of lasting peace among the nations of the world. The defeat of Germany will not mean the end of the war against Japan. On the contrary, we must be prepared for a long and costly struggle in the Pacific. Uh, Princess Elizabeth in the UK joined the ATS as a truck driver and mechanic and I'd like to show you now a little bit of film. It was never actually used in the newsreel but it was recorded um, and you're going to see this now. Despite the war, many other things carried on as normal, and one of these on the 15th of March was the 17th Academy Awards Ceremony in the States. 
and best picture went to Going My Way. Right, back to the war. Uh, Adolf Hitler, on the 19th of March, ordered that um, everything was to be burnt as they retreated. Industry, military installations, everything. A sort of burnt uh, uh, policy. Uh, he didn't want anything to be captured by uh, the Allied forces. On March the 21st, British troops liberated um, parts of Burma in Mandalay. Now, one interesting thing, um, as the Allied forces came into Germany, uh, they reached Mika salt mines, where the gold reserves of the Nazi German Reichbank uh, had been stored. Uh, you can see here in the caves all of the, um, um, the gold. I'll just show you a clip from a movie of the time. The Merkur's salt mine. And discover the hidden remnants of Nazi corruption and terror. It was absolutely staggering. They found sacks containing gold bullion, over 7,000 of them, piled up in neat piles inside the mine that measured 75 feet deep and 150 feet wide. They also found 98 million French francs, in addition to this incredible amount of gold coin. But most shocking, the Allies find luggage containing gold fillings that have been extracted from the victims of the concentration camps. Uh, in the Far East, the Japanese battleship Yamato had been sunk by the Americans 200 miles north of o Okinawa while it was on a suicide mission. Uh, President Franklin Roosevelt suddenly died and Vice President Harry Truman became the 33rd President of the United States. As we've seen earlier, uh, Roosevelt had been feeling ill and not very well at all and had actually uh, stood down uh, in many of the duties. Uh, so it didn't really come as a surprise to anyone in the States at the time. On April the 15th, the uh, Belson uh, concentration camp was liberated by the British and Canadian forces. And of course, we uh, realised then the extent of the terrible atrocities uh, committed by the Nazis. I won't show any film of that um, today because it's so disturbing. On his 56th birthday, Adolf Hitler left the bunker to decorate a group of uh, Hitler youth. Um, it was his last trip to the surface from the bunker before he committed suicide. Um, I don't have the original of that, but um, here is a, a contemporary film which shows what happened. Erfolgreichsten Panzerjäger der Berliner Hitlerjugend angetreten! Der Weltstaat zerfallen. Mein Führer, dieser Junge hat allein zwei russische Panzer mit der Panzerfaust erledigt. Sein Name ist Peter Kranz. Also, Peter heißt du. Ich wollte meine Generale hätten deinen Mut. Mein Mauli. Gut, gut. Die Geschichte schaut auf euch. Und wenn Germania aus diesen Trümmern neu emporwächst, Seid ihr die Helden. Heil euch. Oh. 
Well, that was taken from a German film called Downfall, uh, which was also released in um, English. Um, and it, it's a good film because it shows you the sort of uh, mood of the time. And in fact, uh, by that stage, Hitler was pretty down. Uh, he'd been taking vast amounts of drugs. You notice his hand shaking, although, of course, that was an actor. But it'll give you some idea of what those final days were like. In fact, it was shortly afterwards, on April the 30th, that Adolf Hitler committed suicide with Eva Braun. Um, it wasn't just Hitler, but many other Germans decided to commit suicide, mainly, I think, because, of course, they'd committed terrible atrocities with the Soviet um, for, um, invasion, uh, and they knew that the Russians would ret um, have retribution uh, when they came back into Germany. So uh, an estimated, just in one town alone, in uh, Demen, um, 700 to 2,500 suicides uh, took place. We can't be sure of the exact number, uh, but that's the sort of ballpark figures that we're aware of. By May the 2nd, the Soviet Union announced the fall of Berlin, uh, and Soviet uh, soldiers hoisted the red flag over the Reich ch uh, Chancery. Uh, I'll show you a bit of... Um, uh, uh, newsreel from the time. Идет сражение в Берлине. Бой грим. Весь мир волновала в эти дни радостная весть. Красная армия в Берлине. Решающий удар нанесен. Война бушует в берлинских кварталах. Полной мерой получает Берлин за все. За Лондон, за Ленинград, за Варшаву, за Смоленск и Воронеж. За тысячи городов, за десятки тысяч сел и деревень. Like Hitler presenting medals, I thought I'd also show you another extract from a film which in a way caps the sort of atmosphere um, of the uh, Soviet uh, move into Berlin. Uh, this is a Russian film. Um, a modern film, but it'll give you some idea of uh, uh, the feel of the time. bit of PR I think really but it'll give you some idea of those uh, uh, times. Um, by May the 4th the Germans had surrendered. Uh, all of the armed forces surrendered to Field Marshal Montgomery um, and I'll show you a contemporary um, newsreel from uh, showing this ceremony actually taking the place. report I've ever made. Here come the Germans who surrendered to Monty. General Admiral von Friedeberg Rear Admiral Wagner, General Kinsel, and the rest. After trying unsuccessfully to surrender various armies, then fighting against the Russians, they were now trying at the Field Marshal's headquarters on Lüneburg Heath to see if they couldn't get terms for the armies opposing the 21st Army Group. Naturally, Monty told them it must be unconditional surrender, and incidentally, it looks as if the Chief's interpreter got a real kick out of interpreting his remarks. In the event of their not agreeing to unconditional surrender, Monty said, I shall go on with the war and will be delighted to do so and all your soldiers may be killed. That made the Huns think and this is them thinking it. It didn't take them very long and when after contacting Field Marshal Bush they came back to the tent, well Monty told them in his own inimitable way exactly and precisely what it was all about. <laughs> 
Right, let's move on because we'll come back to that uh, later on in our slideshow. On May the 7th, uh, General uh, Jody um, actually signed the unconditional German surrender in Shave headquarters in Reims, France, and that would be effective from um, 2300 hours uh, on May the 8th. And of course, that was to lead to the VE Day celebrations, which we'll talk about later. But again, here's a bit of Pathé news from the time. Few commanders can have had such loyal service as you have given me. In the early day of the war, the British Empire stood alone against the combined might of the Axis powers. And during those days, we suffered some great disasters. But we stood firm on the defensive, but striking blows where we could. Later, we were joined by Russia and America. And from then onwards, the end was in no doubt. Let us never forget what we owe to our Russian and American allies. This great allied team has achieved much in war, may it achieve even more in peace. Um, following the surrender, a lot of things started to happen. For example, RAF took uh, Lancasters to Germany to repatriate some of the British uh, prisoners of war. In fact, about 4,500 were brought back to Great Britain within 24 hours. We said already that May the 8th would be Victory in Europe Day, VE Day, and it was observed by all of the Western powers as the Nazis surrendered, uh, marking the end of World War II in Europe. Yesterday morning at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Forces and simultaneously to the Soviet Command. Uh, we'll come back again to that in part two. Uh, July the 5th, uh, the world doesn't stand still after the end of the war in Europe and we held a general election. Uh, the counting of the votes and declarations was a delayed really uh, up until July the 26th, mainly to a large, uh, allow the large number of uh, service people abroad to be able to vote. And, of course, it takes uh, time for those votes to come in. And, of course, the big surprise was that Winston Churchill uh, wasn't brought into power um, at the end of the war. It was uh, Labour who achieved this. Men of South East Asia Command got their ration of electioneering like the rest of us. The Burma weather was hot, and so were the speakers at first. Voting forms came out by air and gave the postman one of his busiest days. Ballot papers are handed out. Jungle polling booths are more primitive than the black tin boxes at home, but they're secret nevertheless. The sergeant brings an advisor along. The Burma men say, in the election that was to put Labour into power, is quickly on its way to England. Lord Louis Mountbatten, welcomed by his wife and daughter, is back from his command in South East Asia. He's reported to be here for consultations in connection with the Berlin Conference. Japan, take note. Right, uh, so as we heard, July the 26th, um, following the election, Winston Churchill resigned as Prime Minister and Clement Attlee became our new Prime Minister. July the 16th, 
the Trinity test. That was the test of the first atomic bomb. And of course, that was to lead to um, the Americans unleashing two um, atom bombs on Japan to uh, force their surrender at Hiroshima uh, and Nagasaki. But that was later on, of course. <laughs> Uh, July the 29th, the BBC Light Programme radio station is launched, aimed at light entertainment uh, and music, which of course was a, a nice bonus at the end of the war. On September the 2nd, World War II ended in the Far East as well, as the Japanese surrendered. <laughs> Japan surrender delegates are received in Manila with cold formality. Their chief, Lieutenant General Kawabe, and an American officer, who almost, but not quite, gives a handshake. Kawabe is met by Major General Willoughby, MacArthur's Chief of Intelligence. These envoys from Emperor Hirohito are here to get their surrender orders. First job is to hand over their credentials for checking. Before the series of Far East capitulations is done, we're going to get pretty well used to this kind of picture. If you want to learn how to put on a poker face, take a look at a few of these samples. First pictures of Act Two of the Surrender Drama. Scene, Rangoon, chief characters, representatives of the Allied Supreme Command, and an unhappy looking bunch of sons of heaven. Field Marshal Count Terauchi, Jap Supreme Commander in Burma, sends his Chief of Staff, General Numata, and Rear Admiral Shudo to lead the surrender envoys. The capitulation ceremony took place at Rangoon's government house, a dress rehearsal for the final SEAC surrender at Singapore. The Jap officers wore khaki green uniforms, and as usual, there were plenty of ceremonial swords about. <music> Heading the British official delegates was General Boy Browning, Deputy Supreme Commander to Lord Louis Mountbatten. General Browning did the talking, and the Japanese trio listened. The documents will be placed before the Chief of Staff to His Excellency Count Terachi, and I shall sign them when they are returned. General Numata signed the instrument of surrender in Japanese script. Seven minutes of tense drama. So, for the rest of uh, 1945, we can look at other things in the war. So, for example, in October, Arthur C. Clarke put forward the idea of geosyn geosynchronous uh, communication satellites in one of his uh, um, uh, magazine articles. Now, it's interesting that often science fiction writers um, come up with ideas which later on um, because become quite normal. And this is one good example. We are now surrounded by these communication satellites which have improved uh, our ability to communicate around the world enormously. Talking about so, um, um, technology, perhaps a more mundane thing, on the 2nd of October Piccadilly Circus tube station became the first one to be lit by fluorescent lights. We take these for granted now but again at the time this was pretty new technology. I'd like to talk about um, a film now that came out in 1945, The Wicked Lady. This is one of Gainsborough pictures. You must probably remember them. Um, they brought out a lot of movie in those days. And it star starred um, Margaret Lockwood and James Mason. And here's a little extract. I did. I did. What is it, Helga? Oh, I was afraid you wouldn't come in time. I'm not afraid to meet my maker. It's you I'm troubled about. What will you do without my spiritual guidance? I don't know, Hogarth. Drink this and get well. I fear you're not strong enough to bear the burden alone. Let me tell Sir Ralph, my lady. He's a good man. He'll help you when I'm gone. Um, 
uh, another film, uh, much better known, I think, uh, on the 26th of November, uh, Arthur Rank released this film, Brief Encounter. Um, so I'm sure you remember this one with Trevor Howard and Celia Johnson. And again, I'll show you an extract from this film. I wish I could think of something to say. It doesn't matter not saying anything, I mean. I'll miss my train and wait and see you in No, yours. please don't. I'll come over with you to your platform. I'd rather. Very well. Do you think we shall ever see each other again? I don't know. Not for years, anyway. The children will all be grown up. I wonder if they'll ever meet and know each other. Couldn't I write to you? Just once in a while. No, Alec, please, you know we promised. Oh, my dear. I do love you so very much. I love you with all my heart and soul. I want to die. If only I could die. If you died, you'd forget me. I want to be remembered. Yes, I know I do, too. We've still got a few minutes. Laura, what a lovely surprise. My dear, I've been shopping till I'm dropping. My feet are nearly falling off. My throat's parched. I thought of having dear spindles, but I was terrified of losing the train. Oh, dear. Oh, um, this is Dr. Harvey. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? Would you be a perfect day and get me a cup of tea? I really don't think I could drag my poor old bones over to the counter. No, please. It was cruel of fate to be against us right up to the very last minute. Dolly Messiter. Poor, well-meaning, irritating Dolly Messiter crashing into those last few precious minutes we had together. She chattered and fussed, but I didn't hear what she said. I felt dazed and bewildered. No sugar. It's in the spoon. Alec behaved so beautifully, with such perfect politeness. No one could have guessed what he was really feeling. And then... Has your train? Yes, I know. Oh, aren't you coming with us? No, I go in the opposite direction. My practice is in Chelsea. Oh, I see. I'm a general practitioner at the moment. Dr. Harvey's going out to Africa next week. Oh, how thrilling. The train now arriving at platform four is the 540 for Shirley, Lee Green and the Langham. I must go. Yes, you must. Goodbye. Goodbye. I felt the touch of his hand on my shoulder for a moment. And then he walked away. Away out of my life forever. <laughs> He's got to get right over to the other platform. Talking of missing trains reminds me of that awful bridge at Broadham Junction. Dolly still went on talking, but I wasn't listening to her. I was listening for the sound of his train starting. <whistles> then it did. I said to myself, he didn't go. The last minute his courage failed him, he couldn't have gone. Any minute now, he'll come back into the refreshment room pretending he's forgotten something. I prayed for him to do that just so that I could see him again for an instant. But the minutes went by. Is that the train? Oh, can you tell me? Is that the Ketchworth train? No, it's the express. The boat train. Well, of course, that doesn't stop, does it? I want some chocolate, please. Milk or play? Right, moving on. On the same day, John Amory, the British fascist, pleaded guilty to treason and was hung almost immediately. Hey, on a brighter note, 31st of December, Britain received its first shipment of bananas since the beginning of the war. Now, I remember as a young child the... Uh, um, the uh, problems of getting bananas. I went with, after school with my mother into the corner shop and uh, the owner looked around uh, furtively and then said to my mum, I've got some bananas for you under the counter. It was almost like gold in those days. Here's a bit of a um, Pathé newsreel from the time. <laughs> It began last October with a crop of preliminary posters. Now the bananas are here in person, and at Avonmouth docks they're welcomed by Bristol's Lord Mayor. The first cargo of bananas that has arrived at this port since the war. We hope it's the prelude of many more to come. 
and that the prosperity and development of our trade will continue for many long years to be. Will you accept the chance for please? Would you, would you like one? Yes, please. That's splendid. Splendid, that's Thank splendid. You. Splendid. A committee of banana tasters make a dockside test. Isn't it lovely? They're of the finest quality, and they're very nice too. This first shipment of five million goes to children under 18 living in southwest England. For the not so lucky parts of the country, there's news that other boats are on the way. It won't be long now before we can all say, have a banana. Well, there we are. That's the end of 1945, our slideshow. So I'm now going to have a little quiz. And most of these questions will be things I've talked about already. So it'll be a good way to see if you've been watching. Now, because I can't hear what you are saying, and like our normal uh, Thursday time travel, what I'll do is I'll read out the question, wait a few seconds for you to think about the answer, and then I'll give it to you. And it's up to you to decide if you did well or not. First question, who joined Roosevelt and Winston Churchill at the Yalta Conference? Well, you might remember because we saw the photograph. It was Joseph Stalin. Next question, what wartime organisation did Princess Elizabeth join? Remember, we covered this earlier and showed a bit of film. The answer is the ATS, the Auxiliary Territorial Service, and she joined as a truck driver mechanic. Remember, we saw the pictures of her actually fiddling with the engine. On July the 5th, 1945, a general election is held. Which party came into power? Now, this should be an easy one. We covered it, and I'm sure you all remember. The answer, the Labour Party. This was covered in the film, so you should be able to remember. Where were the gold reserves of the Nazi German Reichsbank stored? You might not remember the name, but you might remember where it was found, the sort of place. The answer is it was a salt mine, the Merkers salt mine. And here's the picture we saw earlier. Back to a film we just watched an extract from. Who wrote Brief Encounter? The answer was Noel Coward. Well, that's the end of part one. Um, and what we'll do is we'll perhaps have a tea break or something before um, we watch part two. So I'll see you again in a few minutes time and I hope you enjoyed part one. I can assure you part two will be a lot more fun because we're talking about the VE Day celebrations. <laughs>